As a fantasy author, I'm obsessed with trying to figure out how to write better stories, but I was still quite surprised when I figured out that I've read 37 writing advice books over the past few years. All of these books have been hugely important for my development as a writer. A good book, much like a good mentor, can really accelerate your own writing journey forward by months or years. Of course, you can't just be reading writing advice books, you have to actually be writing as well, but it is no exaggeration to say that for me personally, there have been writing advice books that have totally changed my perspective on the craft of storytelling and have really helped bring my writing dreams to fruition. So in this video, I'm going to be sharing the three biggest lessons I've learned from reading 37 books on the craft of writing. Lesson number one is that outlining and structure is actually liberating. When I'm talking to young writers about the idea of outlining, I'm often met with quite a bit of resistance and they often tell me, oh, I don't like the idea of outlining, it just feels like that's going to sap my creativity. The thing is, outlining your novel in advance, knowing what you're going to write before you actually start that first draft. I would argue is more creative than the alternative. That's because you could easily do five or six different outlines over the space of one week and explore all these different possible directions for your novel and then just cherry pick the bits that you like the most from each of them. And it saves yourself from having to spend two years writing a novel that is a mess, that you get to the end of that process and you think, oh, that was a waste of time. Why hadn't I planned this out to begin with? Outlining is a far more efficient and creative approach. And it's really a good antidote and solution to prevent you from writing something that is messy and unreadable at the end of that process. Perhaps the biggest benefit of outlining though is that it really helps you nail your character development and your plot structure, which are two things that a lot of new writers really struggle with. And the reason it's so effective at doing that is because a solid outline gives you this bird's eye view of your story. It allows you to see the whole thing at a glance and you can easily pick up once you have that bird's eye view oh, this part of the story is kind of lagging behind or this part over here is more interesting but it's not explored in enough detail, let's go into that, let's move away from this thing. An outline just gives you more vantage point, more perspective on what you're actually writing. And it also helps you write a lot faster as well. I know that when I was starting out as a writer, my very first book that I wrote, The Aeon Academy, took me 360 days to write the first draft. And that's because I had no plan, no outline, no understanding of story structure. And then I read a bunch of books about outlining and structuring your novel. And when I wrote my second book, Cross Broken Stars, that only took me 60 days to write the first draft instead of 360 days. And the story was in a much more legible, coherent form uh, as opposed to my very first book, The Aeon Academy. So for me personally, outlining was a huge game changer. It meant that I was able to write faster and I was able to write something with more resonance and more cohesion for the plot. So if you're in the camp right now where you've never tried outlining before and you have resistance to it, I would strongly encourage you to just give it a shot. Maybe it won't work for you. Maybe you will be better off just making stories up by the seat of your pants, you know, being a pantser as it's called. But if you're anything like me, the structure that outlining provides might actually be the tool that unlocks your true creative potential. So when it comes to my actual outlining process, it is something that has evolved a lot over the years. I'm actually planning to probably make a course, a really detailed course on it at some point in the future. So be sure to comment down below if that would be useful to you. But at a broad level, what I'm trying to achieve with my outline is an understanding of the following seven key plot points. So I'm gonna run through how these work and to show them in action, I'm gonna go through Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and show you how these seven key plot points are present in this book. So number one is the opening hook. This is where you introduce the protagonist and especially his flaws and desires in a compelling and interesting way. In Harry Potter, an orphan baby is left defenseless at a doorstep on a cold winter night by Dumbledore, a wizard. Number two, we have plot turn one, which usually happens around a quarter of the way into a book. This is where the protagonist is taken from the ordinary world and thrust into the extraordinary world. So in the case of Harry Potter, this is when Harry enters Hogwarts. And in fact, if you pick up the first six Harry Potter books and you literally flip through to the first quarter mark, you look at the 25% of the way through the story, pretty much every single book has Harry entering Hogwarts almost on that exact page, or if not on that exact page, very close to that location. Number three, we have the first pinch point. This is where pressure is applied to the main character through the introduction or a key action from the antagonist. So in Harry Potter, Harry's scar hurts when he looks at Snape and he senses the presence of Voldemort. Number four, we have the midpoint, which happens, you guessed it, halfway through the story. Now this is where your protagonist moves from sort of passive reaction to the events of the narrative to active action, and they resolve to stop the antagonist. In Harry Potter, this is when Harry realizes that the Philosopher's Stone is hidden at Hogwarts, and that Voldemort could use it to return to life. Number five, we have the second pinch point. This is where more pressure is applied to the protagonist, forcing them to their lowest, darkest moment. In Harry Potter, this occurs when Harry and his friends are caught exploring Hogwarts at night after they try to smuggle a dragon out of the grounds. They become hated by the rest of Gryffindor House after losing so many house points. And chapter 15, which occurs literally after this scene, literally opens with the words, 
things couldn't have been worse. Number six, we have plot turn two, which usually happens at around the 75% mark. And this is where the protagonist discovers or realizes a key piece of information that helps them defeat the antagonist. In Harry Potter, this occurs when Harry realizes that Hagrid has told someone how to get past Fluffy and gain access to the Philosopher's Stone which means Voldemort now has no obstacle standing between him and the stone. So Harry resolves to stop him himself. And then lastly, number seven, we have the resolution. This is pretty simple. It's where the protagonist either succeeds or fails in achieving his desire. In the case of Harry Potter, this is where Harry defeats Quirrell and Voldemort at the mirror, stopping Voldemort from coming back to life. Figuring out the best way to structure your novel and if your structure is actually working is really tough to do when you are beginning as a writer, which is why refining your story structure is something that I go through in great depth with writers in my story coaching program. Just earlier today, Today, I was actually doing a complete developmental edit on one of my client's books, where I was essentially mapping out in great detail what his structure looks like currently and how we can make a few small tweaks to fix the things that aren't working with that story structure and massively improve the narrative. Inside my story coaching program, I work with you one-on-one -on -one to help you master the craft of storytelling and quickly achieve your writing goals. Everything I've learned from publishing three fantasy books and a best-selling video game, it's all in this program, which is designed to really help you level up as a writer as quickly as you possibly can. For example, I helped one of my other clients, Michael, outline and write a complete fantasy novella in just a couple of weeks of us starting this program together. And that novella has a really, really cool magic system. It's set in this floating Japanese inspired city. And Michael is now in a really excellent place to hopefully get this book published in the next couple of months. Every aspect of my writing has been upgraded, but I think for me, the biggest thing has just been being able to get my head around everything that is going on in my story. And from outlining to writing to editing, it's like, it's like for years I've been writing with a film over my eyes and blurring my vision. And now it's been scrubbed away. And for the first time, I can see my story and my writing with clarity. And it makes me really excited. Apply for my story coaching using the link in the description down below. And if I think we're a good fit, we'll get on a free call to discuss your writing and the details of the program. So the second big lesson I learned from reading 37 books on writing was how to develop compelling characters. Developing great characters is probably the most important but most difficult challenge that all writers must face. But for me, it became a lot easier once I realized a couple of things. The first idea is that character is not something that stands in isolation from the other elements of your story, like plot, or setting, or even theme. Instead, all the elements in your story are woven together. And that's why when someone asks me, what do you care about more, plot or character? It's really tough to give an answer to that because plot is character. Characters can't really exist outside of the plot that you've created them for. And likewise, plots can't really exist without characters pushing them into progression. And then characters themselves are also defined through their interactions with other characters within the book. As John Truby says in The Anatomy of Story, to create great characters, think of all your characters as part of a web in which each helps define the others. In working out the struggle between your protagonist and antagonist, the larger issues and themes of the story unfold. The second big idea that really helped me better understand how to write compelling characters was this idea that characters are not these static, unchanging entities, but rather they are fluid and they evolve over the course of your story. In other words, they change as a result of pursuing their desires. Now, what I'm talking about here is a character arc, and this is perhaps the central tool in constructing a compelling character. The reason why we get so attached to characters in stories and why we are absolutely hooked on following along their struggles, their journey, their triumphs, their defeats, is because the writer behind that character has created a compelling and interesting character arc. And this is fascinating to us because life is fundamentally about progression and change. As Heraclitus said, no man steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. There are three types of character arcs, a positive character arc, a flat character arc, and a negative character arc. In a positive arc, the protagonist will start out with varying levels of personal unfulfillment and denial. Over the course of the story, he will be forced to challenge his beliefs about himself and the world until finally he conquers his inner demons, and as a result, probably his outer antagonist as well, and ends his arc having changed in a positive way. An example of this would be Vin in the Mistborn series by Brandon Sanderson. Next, we have a flat arc. In a flat arc, the character is already a hero and doesn't require any noticeable personal growth to gain the inner strength to defeat the external antagonists. These characters experience little to no change over the course of the story, making their arc static or flat. So these characters are often the catalyst for change in the story around them. And rather than them changing, they will actually force the world to change around them instead. A great example of this would be Percy Jackson in Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. At the very start of the first book, Percy is a brave individual who sacrifices himself to save his friends. 
And at the end of the very last book, Percy Jackson is a brave individual who's continuing to sacrifice himself to save his friends. He doesn't really change in a noticeable way throughout the story. Obviously, he matures and he grows older from 12 to 16 over the course of the story, but his fundamental beliefs about the world are fairly consistent throughout the narrative. Rather, the focus is on how he changes the world around him. Lastly, in a negative character arc, you basically take a positive character arc, but you flip it on its head. So the character starts in a good place and ends in a worse place than they began the story. A fantastic example of this would be Leo Dan Brock in the Age of Madness trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. He basically experiences this tragic arc where he starts off as this idealistic, hope-filled, heroic figure, and then he ends the series in a very different place. So those are our three types of character arcs, positive, flat, and negative. None of these is necessarily better than the other, it just depends on what type of story you're wanting to tell. Now, on a more tangible level, how do you actually create this character arc? Fundamentally, it comes down to five key questions. The first is, what is your character's want? What is the thing that they desire in this world? Second of all is what is your character's need? What is the thing that they actually need to achieve inner peace and happiness? Next you have, what is the character's lie? What is a mistruth that they believe about the world which is affecting the way that they go about their life? And then compared to that, number four, what is the character's truth? What realization about the world or new belief do they need to come to accept in order to achieve peace and happiness? And then lastly, number five, what is your character's ghost? What traumatic event in their past is motivating their behavior and inspiring them to change? Combined with a solid understanding of story structure, so taking everything I've just said about character arcs and then fusing it with that seven plot point structure I gave earlier in this video, you can develop a seamless fusion between a character's internal journey and the external movement of the plot. And by fusing these together, you will craft a emotionally compelling story about a character changing as a result of their struggle in the pursuit of their desires. So the third big lesson that I learned from reading 37 books on writing was the right way to market a book. Now, if you're anything like I was when I was starting out, the idea of marketing might make you feel icky. You probably got into writing to be an artist, not a businessman. But what I've learned over the years and from reading a lot of books about story marketing as well, is that if you actually wanna be fulfilled and have longevity and have the time and space to actually write the stories that you wanna write, it's not enough to just be an artist, but you also have to learn some fundamentals about business and marketing as well to support your artistic career and pursuits. And marketing certainly doesn't have to be a drain. This YouTube channel, for example, this is a form of marketing, but I find it really enjoyable to actually put these videos together to articulate my thoughts on the craft of storytelling. Likewise, uh, when I've hosted podcasts in the past, those have also been a source of marketing, but they've also been a great way for me to connect with other authors that I super admire and learn a lot about writing for myself. But when it comes down to book marketing, as useful as having a YouTube channel can be or building a podcast can be as well, what I've learned is this. Marketing is not something you can apply after your book is done to make it sell. Rather, marketing must be embedded within the product itself from the very beginning. As Chris Fox says, writing to market is picking an underserved genre that you know has a voracious appetite and then giving that market exactly what it wants. It means that before you write word one of your novel, you already know you're going to have fans waiting to buy it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with writing an extremely esoteric space fantasy novel about Amish kittens trying to find romance or something extremely niche like that. But the reality is that there are gonna be a lot less readers eager for that book than there will be readers eager for something like a classic epic fantasy story about magicians and dragons. And as a result, it's gonna be easier to market that second book. So writing to market is not about selling out. It is a recognition instead of the fact that if you want financial success as an author, which is really critical to the longevity of you being able to do this thing and for giving you as much opportunity and energy to pursue the craft of storytelling to master the art of writing stories as much as you possibly can. If you want to do those things, then you need to find the intersection between what you enjoy writing and what readers enjoy reading. I failed to do this with some of my early books. Early on, I just wrote whatever I wanted. And then once I was done, I tried to figure out how to market the thing. But that all really changed for me when I figured that I'd been doing my writing process backwards. See, I'd been writing my book, then figuring out maybe the title, then getting a cover design for it, then writing a blurb, then sort of figuring out what genre it fit in, and then trying to, you know, get it out to reviewers, get readers interested in it, that sort of thing. But after reading quite a few books on marketing, I realized that I was looking at this in the total opposite way to how readers actually experience your book. The way that readers actually experience your book is they start by being a fan of a certain genre, such as epic fantasy. Then they see a cool cover and title. Then they read the blurb. And it's only then, once they've gone through those three steps, 
that then they will read through the opening pages and chapters of your book. And if your story is good enough, hopefully you hook them enough to get a sale and get them reading the whole story. And of course, that last step is the most important part of the marketing process because in the long run, the best marketing is to write an incredible book that makes them recommend it to all their friends. Word of mouth. So when it came to writing my interactive fiction novel, Sea to Treblin, this kind of reversed marketing approach is exactly what I followed. I started by defining the genre that I wanted to write epic fantasy, and then the associated tropes that I was interested in exploring, like sieges, uh, the costs and perils of leadership, war, magic, all of these sort of things that I was really interested in exploring and that I knew readers would like to explore as well. Then once I had the genre sorted, then I wrote the blurb. And it was only once myself and my publisher had figured out that this title, this genre, and this blurb was marketable, only then did I actually start writing this story. Now, you might turn your nose up at that. You might think this is a compromised way of writing a story. And the good news is you don't actually have to follow anything I'm saying here. There are lots of stories about writers who just sort of create whatever they want. They don't really care about the market and they do luck into something. They manage to still get their books selling. But those writers are the rare exception. It is a lot harder to find success as an author in that fashion. Because the thing is, you're gonna spend one to two years writing a book anyway. Wouldn't you rather know that there are readers on the other side of that process? I know for me personally, I would. And for me personally, just taking a couple of days or even a few weeks to figure out the blurb and the title and maybe a rough idea of the cover before I start writing a story doesn't detract from the enjoyment I experience of writing that book anyway. It doesn't impede my creativity. If anything, it's actually this really good focusing agent because now that I know what sort of emotional experience that I'm working towards with the story, I can just keep the narrative far more focused and coherent as I kind of get towards that goal. And bringing it full circle back to Sea to Travelin, that approach really paid off because that has been easily the biggest hit of my writing career so far. And it's sold over 13,000 copies and it's only been out for about a year. When you get your stories, genre, title, blurb and cover right, all of the other marketing involved is just so much easier. In fact, those four elements there, I would argue that is 90% of your marketing. That's where the vast majority of your effort and marketing energy should be going into. Because when you get that stuff right, it just makes it so much easier to appeal to readers, to get reviewers to check out your book and promote it on their channels. And all of your marketing efforts don't feel like you're pushing this boulder up a hill, but rather like you're rolling it down the hill instead. Thanks for watching. For those of you who are alongside me in pursuit of great stories, keep writing, keep striving. I'll see you in the next video.